Welcome to Terror, where darkness dwells and fear reigns. Your guide to these harrowing tales is the godfather of Dogman himself, Dark Waters. With over 300 interviews under his belt, Dark Waters has established himself as the creme de la creme of true encounter narration. Founder of Dogman Cams, author of five books and counting, and host of the acclaimed Dark Waters radio show, Dark Waters is a powerhouse in the paranormal field. His show, where he takes live, unscreened calls about chill encrypted encounters, consistently ranks among the top 10 online paranormal radio stations. By fostering his own unique genre of vetted true stories, Dark Waters has opened the door for others to follow in his footsteps. Though many claim to possess unseen notebooks full of stories, none can match his mastery of terror. Now sit back, relax, and take a break from the strife and confusion out there. Let the undisputed king of the dogman realm regale you with more disturbing tales plucked straight from the shadows. The Godfather is back again with new true encounters that define terror. His polished delivery distills storytelling down to its spine-tingling essence. You've entered the lair where storytelling is perfected, so brace yourself for another masterclass in fear. The Dark Waters beckons. It's time to take a swim. Listen, I'm not even sure how I got here, man. One minute I'm arguing with my wife at 1 a.m. over some text messages she's sending to this other guy. And the next thing you know, I'm standing here in the middle of nowhere staring at whatever the hell this freaking thing is. And frankly, I can't even really describe to you what I'm looking at. But let's back up a little bit. This all started at 1 a.m. And at 1 a.m. I was already about to have a bad day. I wake up, getting ready to go to work, and my wife Melanie and I get into this huge fight. Why? Because she's texting some other guy named Mark. And so imagine a scene. I'm laying in bed next to her. I sit up and I look at her and I say, Melanie, so you're trying to tell me while I was asleep, preparing to go to work at 1 a.m. to feed our family, you are there texting your quote unquote friend, Mark? Get the hell out of here. I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. And I need you to understand. See, Melanie and I had problems with this before where she was messing around with some guy. So I make it very clear. I say, Melanie, if I find out you're talking to another man, you will be living with your mother permanently. Do you understand? Me? Permanently. Fast forward, it's 2.30 a.m. And I'm in the bad part of town. Talking about pure hood. I go to repo a Dodge Hellcat. And let me tell you something. I don't even understand why these guys are running around buying these expensive Dodge Hellcats when they know they can't afford to pay the note. The number one car that I've been repossessing is the Dodge Hellcat. And every time I have to repo a Hellcat, I got to go to the hood. Listen to me when I say this to you. I've been reporting cars for 15 years, and I never encountered what I encountered that morning. I'm there, right? Pull up to the house, and these dudes are already there waiting on me. Come out, guns drawn. Tell me to get out of my truck and attempt to rob me. So now I'm standing outside of the truck, and I'm like, listen, I don't have no money on me. And it was like, you repo men always got money on you. I'm like, dude, I don't have any money on me. Well, you're not taking this Hellcat. I tell him, obviously, I'm not taking a vehicle because it's seven of you with AR-15s pointed at me. I'm getting ready to go on about my business. You can keep your car. It was right then and there as I was pulling away that I came to the realization that these dudes are robbing repo men. What has the world come to when you rob the guy who's repossessing a car? It used to be that, hey, you come out the house, you're angry, you swing a bat, you might have a gun. But man, you knew you was wrong. You ain't been paying your bill. These dudes are robbing repo men. And if that wasn't bad enough, fast forward to 3.30 a.m. I'm at the next job. It's a minivan parked out front. I pull up, attach the van. I'm getting ready to pull off. 
This man comes running out of the house. He's got to be 55 years old, stands in front of my truck. He says, please, man, please don't take this van. I tell him, sir, you know you haven't been paying your bill. You know it. Why are you making this hard on me? He goes on to explain to me that he has to take his daughter off to college the next morning and points out that all of her stuff is in the back of the van. And he tells me he only has $1,000, and that's the last little bit of money he has, but he owed $1,200. I'm standing there talking to the guy. Tears are welling up in his eyes, and he says, man, I can't fail my family. I can't. I do everything for my family. Now, listen, I'm not known to have a heart when it comes to this, but I'm looking at him, looking at the van, and realizing this is an honest guy who's just in a bad situation. So I tell him, listen, give me the $1,000 you have. I'm going to add $200 with it. And I'll come back in two weeks and get the $200 from you. And you should have seen the look on his face. The man hugs me. I mean, hugs me tight and says, thank you so much. I put his van down and go on about my business. Now, I need you to understand something. As I'm driving away, this has been an epic failure of a morning already. These cats tried to rob me. Now I'm $200 in a hole trying to help this man. And it only gets worse from there. Because my next stop is to pick up a Kia. I want you to understand this. A Kia. We're not talking about a Mercedes-Benz. We're not talking about a Bentley. We're not talking about a Lamborghini. We're not even talking about a Lexus. We're talking about a Kia. And there was something weird about this. Because normally I get paid about $150 to $450 to get one of these vehicles. But they were paying three times the normal amount for this Kia. And it dawned on me, somebody inside of the finance company was taking this particular car personally. Now, let me say this to you. If you are a person who has a problem with your vehicle, like you're late on payments, listen, the finance company doesn't want to take your car. Just call and talk to them. Matter of fact, if you call and talk to them, they have programs that they'll put you on where they'll roll the payments that you're behind to the back end of the loan. It's only people who call them that are utter crazy that this happens to. And so now I know in the back of my mind that where I'm going to get this Kia, this person is probably the biggest on the planet. I do a drive-by past the house and I notice that the key is not parked in the driveway. It's off to the side of the property, parked off in the woods. And I'm saying to myself, now why in the hell would this man park this vehicle in the woods? It's not parked deep enough in the woods to where it's hidden. It's just parked away from the house. And put yourself in my shoes for a moment. They're paying three times the normal amount for this vehicle. I'm already $200 in a hole. I'm like, listen, I'm pulling up, getting this, attaching it, and getting the hell out of here. So I back in, hit the gas, and I hitch the car on. And the man comes out of his front door and runs over. And he says, listen, leave that vehicle alone, man. Don't mess with that car. I tell him, sir, you know you ain't been paying for this car. I got to take this vehicle. He says, listen, I'm not paying for something that I can't drive. Leave the car alone. I'm warning you, leave that car alone. Then he turns and goes inside of the house. Now I'm thinking to myself that he's going in the house to get a shotgun or a pistol. But no, he goes inside and turns the lights off. So now I'm like, all right, easy peasy. I got it hit, I got it attached, I hit the gas to go and pull off, and the car's not moving. So now I'm saying to myself, maybe he's chained this car to a tree. I don't know what the hell is going on. So I hop out with my flashlight, and now I'm inspecting the car. And when I get right to the driver's side door of that car, I hear a growl, shine that light up, and there's this thing standing at the back of the vehicle. And I need you to understand something. As I take a closer look at the car, all the windows are broken out and there's all kind of leaves and crap inside of this vehicle. So now I'm looking at the car, looking at this thing, looking at the car, looking at this thing, and I shine the light up and down and it looks like some kind of freaking werewolf. Later on, I learned that people like you call it dog man, but to me, that was a freaking werewolf. That's when I start to hear what sounds like something walking to my right in the woods. And when I shine the light over there, there is nothing but golden eye shine. Three sets of eyes right there looking at me. This thing growls again. And guess what? I get the message. Somehow, some way, this is your car. And guess what? You can have it. So I run, hop in, detach that damn car and drive off getting the hell out of there. Head back home. And when I get home, I go to tell my wife what's going on. And then I remember this was just texting Mark before I left the house. So I just sit there early in the morning and smoke a cigarette. The worst day of my life. And it only lasted six hours.
Listen, let me tell you about my dog, Fleabag. And I know, I know, I know, don't judge me. Just hear me out. This little dog is a freaking menace. Got Napoleonic complex to the third degree. And when I tell you, this thing will bite anyone and anything. If your kid is in the area, he will bite your kid. He will bite an adult. He will even go after dogs that's way larger than him. I'm talking about dogs that will kill him in one bite. There is literally something wrong with Fleabag. The dog was so wild that there came this point in time where I considered putting him down. Nonetheless, it's a Thursday morning. I get up, take Fleabag for a walk. He does his business. And the neighbor's German shepherd jumps the fence. Fleabag takes off, charging at this dog, gets bitten and tossed. Literally tossed like a freaking rag dog. Comes at him again, gets bitten and tossed again. This goes on for four more times before he stops and comes back over by me. And I need you to understand something. I had enough with this freaking dog. The month prior to this, he cost me a $5,000 homeowner's insurance claim because he ran across the street to that same house where that German shepherd lived and bit the neighbor's son. Luckily, he only got his shoes and was biting on his shoes. But nonetheless, they sued me, $5,000. So when I see the German shepherd jump the fence and tear into his, I already know what it's all about. And I say to myself, you know what? I'm not rewarding his bad behavior anymore. He's going to be a leash dog. I'm going to leash him and tie him to a pole outside. And I don't care if it's winter, spring, summer, fall. Your ass flea bag is staying outside of the house. And I know there's a lot of you out there who are dog lovers, but I need you to understand this dog is a demon. He's done torn up pillows, bed spreads, ripped sheets, done it all. He's getting on my last flipping nerve. So at night, I take him outside, drive a stake in the ground, and put him on a chain and go back inside. And he goes to barking and barking and barking. At first, it's that roof, 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 like he's calling me to come get him. Then he calms down, quiets down about midnight. He starts barking again. And I'm talking about crazy, aggressive barking, like he's growling at something outside in the woods. 12.30, I go outside because I can't take the noise anymore. When I come outside, I'm looking at him. I'm saying, listen, you gonna make me put you to sleep because you are getting on my last nerve. As I go to detach him from the stake that's driven into the ground and unleash him, he takes off running into the woods. And so now I'm pissed because I have to go into the woods and get him. So I go back inside, get a flashlight, come outside and start walking through the woods. He's barking and growling and growling and barking, making all this noise. And by the time I get up to him, I realize that flea bag is not alone. And on top of that, flea bag is not on the ground because what my eyes behold is this thing that looks like a freaking werewolf holding him by the back of his neck up in the air in front of his face. And he is just barking and growling and barking and growling. It looks at me, looks at him, looks at me, looks at him and throws my damn dog up against a tree. When I say throws my dog up against a tree, have you ever seen like one of those girls college softball championships where they do that arm spin, where they swing their arm around and then throw a ball underhanded? That's exactly what he does to Fleabag. He drops his arm down backwards and flings his little ass up against the tree. Wa-bam! And when I tell you Fleabag died instantly, Fleabag died instantly. And then it looks at me like, do you want to be next? And I'm like, no, sir, no, ma'am. I don't want none of that that just happened. So I turn and run as fast as I can back into the house. And when I tell you that was one of the most terrifying nights I've ever experienced, I didn't hear any noises, didn't see anything. But man, just the sight of this thing was absolutely frightening. The next morning I get up and go look for Fleabag and sure enough, he's there dead. Neck broken, spine collapsed dead now let me say this for those of y'all listening to the story i hated my dog but i love my dog do i miss flea bag yes but do i have another dog right now no i don't Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, 
Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it brake forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment, and from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof, that thou shouldst take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldst know the paths to the house thereof? Knowest thou it because thou wast then born, or because the number of thy days is great? Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth, where no man is, on the wilderness, wherein there is no man? to satisfy the desolate and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Dog man in the veil. Okay, so how do I explain this to you? I guess I can start here. I've always been a bit of a spiritual guy, you know? Not in, I go to church every Sunday and I go to Bible study on Wednesday, that kind of spiritual person, but I can sense things that most people can't. And when I go to sleep, I have dreams and visions that most people don't. Now to get you up to speed on the story I'm about to tell you, I need to teach you a few things. When you first go to sleep and your body goes off into darkness, Right before you go into the dream realm, you cross the bridge between the natural realm and the dream world, which is called the veil. Now, ever since I was a kid, I have the ability to hang out right there in the veil. And I'm not talking about astral projecting, leaving your body, none of that. I mean, I had the ability just to be in that space. Like I would lay down, close my eyes, and I would be half sleep, half woke. And I've always seen things inside of the veil. Some things are strange, some things are terrifying, but let me tell you something. The moment I saw the dog man in the veil is when I realized that everything that people had been saying about this being an ethereal being was true. Because I lay down to go to sleep one night and I'm comfortable going into the veil, looking around. And the way it works is at first you're in just pure darkness. Sometimes you see these little white flashes that's leftover light from being in the room. But then you get a chance to hone in and you start seeing things. So I get to the point to where the flashes start to go away that light starts to settle in and it turns into this black canvas. And so now I'm looking at that black canvas and I start to see something walking towards me. And at first I think it's a person because I've seen giants in the veil before. I mean like giant people inside of the veil. But this, it's that size, but it doesn't look human. I'm watching, looking, and it's getting closer and closer and closer. And then I start to see the ears. I start to see a snout. I start to see these huge shoulders and long arms. And the next thing I know, 
there is this dog face right in front of me. Looks exactly like freaking Anubis. The most terrifying thing I have ever seen. And its eyes are golden, but they're glowing. This golden glow. It opens his mouth to speak to me and I instantly break myself out of it. Hell to the no. Now I'm not sure if it came to visit me because I was listening to Dogman content and I summoned it through the veil or because I was listening to content and I was aware that it existed, it came to see me. But either way, it doesn't matter to me. I don't want anything to freaking do with no dog, man. Y'all can keep this crazy. The Border Patrol knows they exist. Listen, I frankly don't know where to start telling you about the crazy foolishness that I experienced on my job. But I'll say this. My responsibility was flying UASs, unmanned aircraft systems. You may be saying to yourself, well, I didn't know the Border Patrol had unmanned aircraft systems. And yes, of course, the Border Patrol has drones to surveil the U.S.-Mexico border. I need you to understand something about this place in Texas. Super duper small population, so quiet you can hear a pin drop from a mile away. Or at least so I thought. This particular night, I'm doing my job. And frankly, the only thing I ever did was do my job, and it led to all of this trouble. Listen, I'm flying the drone, scanning the area, looking for illegals. And it's important that you understand for me, this was just another day in the office. I'm sitting there with a cup of coffee. The camera feed on these drones are crystal clear. It's like watching a high definition movie. And that's when I spot them. Seven figures moving fast, but these ain't no illegals. In fact, these aren't even people. They're big. So I'd switch to thermal heat signatures. And when I tell you these are wolves, running on two legs and the way they move is like nothing i have ever seen so now i'm zooming the camera in watching this pack of wolves as they're running on two legs leaping and bounding back and forth listen to me when i say this to you talk about mine being blown my mind hit a mud puddle for a split second i didn't know what to do so i slide my chair back and call over one of my friends and say hey man come look at this he walks over and as soon as he looks at the screen he says what the f are those things so now the two of us are looking at the screen and he says man that looks like werewolves i didn't know that there were real werewolves now he makes this loud i'm talking about loud commotion in the office as he is freaking out our supervisor walks up looks at the screen and says turn that off right now I'm talking about this man had anger and disdain in his voice. Turn that off right now and come into my office. So now he calls the two of us into his office, sits us down and says, listen, you didn't see anything. And I'm like, oh no boss, we saw some, we saw some that we ain't supposed to see that's not supposed to exist. He says, listen to me, if you know what's good for you and if you want to keep your job, you didn't see anything. Do you understand? The two of us look at each other and we're like, okay. Now pause, this ain't the first time we caught some on camera that we wasn't supposed to catch. There's been times where we caught military operations on the border where our soldiers were pretty much whacking illegals. I'm talking about killing them. But he seemed extremely pissed about this. So much so that he tells us to go back and erase the footage. So I go back to my desk, erase the footage, and get back to doing my job. I get this, I go home, go to sleep while I'm sleeping. I get a phone call. It's my boss telling me I need to come back into work. And when I get there, Department of Homeland Security is there. Now, I can't tell you how they knew that we had seen this footage, but the Department of Homeland Security is there. They call both of us into the office. And this gentleman says, it's my understanding that you saw some things last night. And I say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sitting there looking at him and realizing that this is about to be a problem. And the best response was, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, yes, you do know exactly what I'm talking about. And it would be in your best interest if you forgot about what you saw. I tell him, sir, I don't remember much from work last night. Maybe I had a little bit too much coffee, but I'm not sure what you're talking about. He looks at us, looks at my boss, looks at us, looks at my boss, and then just turns and walks out of the room. Now, here's where the part of the story comes in. 
Three days pass, count them, one, two, three. My boss calls us both into the office and tells us that we're being reassigned. You understand what I'm saying to you? Reassigned. Man, I'm a drone operator. You don't become a drone operator overnight. I get reassigned to a freaking desk job pushing paperwork. Lose damn near half of my salary because I saw dog band. It wasn't like I went chasing after them, trying to molest them or kiss them or hug them. I just saw them and it changed my life for the worse. Welcome back, Fear Seekers. Before we continue our bone-chilling tales, let's address some common questions about these true encounters. Some of you may be wondering, are these stories really true? Yes, Dark Water specializes in retelling only vetted, real dogman experiences. While skeptics may call them fake, none offer proof or have a public number you can call like Dark Waters does. If you have had a dogman encounter and want your story told, call 504 326 Four two six eight. We don't accept stories by email, only by phone so we can properly vet encounters. Dark Waters personally answers calls every Thursday from 9 to 5 p.m. You're currently listening to the YouTube version of the Dogman album Terror. For the complete ad-free album, sign in at IamDarkWaters.com or become a member today. For the next 24 hours, the promo code will give you a random discount on your membership. Act within the next 24 hours to receive between 30% to 50% off your membership. Listen until the end of the album for the promo code. Now before, remember, these stories come from real people, investigated thoroughly by dark waters. The truth is out there, sometimes it has claws. And now, back to the terror. Hath the rain a father, or who hath begotten the drops of dew, out of whose womb came the ice, and the hoary frost of heaven who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Mazaroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice to the clouds, that abundance of waters may cover thee? Canst thou send lightnings, that they may go, and say unto thee, Here we are? Who hath put wisdom in the inward part, or who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom, or who can stay the bottles of heaven, when the dust groweth into hardness? and the clods cleave fast together. Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion, or fill the appetite of the young lions when they couch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth for the raven his food when his young ones cry unto God? They wander for lack of meat. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever experienced terror? I'm talking about real terror. Of course, like most people, you've probably been scared before. You know the feeling of your heart skipping a beat, your pulse racing. However, terror, this is a whole nother story. It's something completely different. And in my mind, it's a word that people overuse when they're telling their stories. What I experienced, I don't even think the word terror does justice to the feelings and the emotions that I had. But let me start here. I never knew my mother. I was raised by my grandparents because, frankly, my mother was not really a good person. It took her years. I'm talking about years to get her stuff together. My entire childhood, she was a drunk. And in my teen years, she turned to prostitution. Now, I understand the entire time I knew my mother was alive, I had seen pictures of her, but I had never met her. It wasn't until I was 26 years old that my mother came around, reformed, and wanted to meet me. I remember being extremely nervous to see her. Only thing I'd ever seen was pictures of her. 
And when the day came, let's just say it was a tad bit underwhelming. She looked like she was 65 years old, wrinkled. She had a tattoo of a deer in the center of her chest. The antlers went up around her neck on each side. She had blonde hair tied into a bun with this blue ribbon awkwardly tied around the front of her forehead. And the first words that came out of my mother's mouth were, you know it wasn't that I didn't want you, right? You understand that, right, son? As she's saying this, tears are falling down out of her eyes. She goes on to explain to me that she was strung out on drugs and she didn't want me to grow up in that type of environment. So she asked my grandparents to raise me. Stepping back, she looks me up and down and smiles and says, it looks like I made a great decision because you look like you turned out to be a really good young man. Well, the next few weekends, she comes back in town more often. And eventually we get to the point to where she invites me to spend a weekend with her. I remember talking to my grandfather about it and asking him if he thought it was a good idea. And he told me the only way I was going to get to know my mother was if I spent time with her and that he felt like she had really turned a corner and made a change. Next thing I know, I was in my car riding a meter, Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Now, let me say this. What my mother did not tell me and did not disclose to me was that she was living on a plot of land with other people. Now, I really wouldn't call what she was involved in a cult, but it sure as hell felt a little bit like a cult when I got there. The people were overly excited to see me, over touchy, over feeling, extra welcoming. Listen, it was really, really some weird man to have strangers walk up to you who you never knew and was like, oh, welcome to our family. I'm talking about 29 people came out to meet me and they all said that they were family. And it was about five minutes after that, that I met their leader. This guy walks out and introduces himself as Reese. Now pause right here and let me say this for a moment. Reese was clearly going for the Native American angle, but Reese was white as snow. He wasn't no Native American man. This was a white guy. He walks up to me, hugs me, and tells me that the great spirit is happy that I came to be with them for a short time. And then we have this huge feast. I'm talking about a massively huge meal, a table seating 30 people. Reese, of course, sitting at the head of the table. Now, when I tell you this entire situation was super duper uncomfortable for me and I felt out of place, I mean, I really did feel out of place. But I waited until after the meal to speak to my mother about it and explain to her exactly how uncomfortable I was in this situation. During that conversation, she claimed that it was Reese and the rest of the people who she called her family that helped her get her life in order. Then my mother hit me with a guilt trip for the very first time. She says, I understand if you don't feel comfortable and you want to leave, but I just wanted to spend time with you so now i'm standing there thinking to myself it's only two nights hang out with your mom try and figure out what's going on and then you can go back and if she invites you to come back again you tell her you're not comfortable and you tell her to come see you that's all you gotta do you know what i'm saying man just take it easy it's only two nights what could go wrong well let me say this a hell of a lot went wrong in those two freaking nights the first night i awake at 2 a.m to the sound of people talking outside of the window I look out there and there's no one there, but I could hear what sounded like people talking on the other side of the window. I stand there for 10 minutes and listen to this audible conversation and there's no one there. And listen, as I'm hearing these audible voices, I got the heebie-jeebies. I'm talking my hairs are standing up on my arm, chills are running up and down my spines. This is not normal, but eventually, I mean, eventually it goes away and I settle down and go back to sleep the next morning. I asked my mother if she heard anything, and she says no. Then we have breakfast, and then everybody meets up in the center, and we go for a walk in the woods. But before we enter the woods, Reese stops and says a prayer, asking the woods to accept me and allow me to enter into them. Now imagine the scene. Everybody's standing behind him in this freaking triangle formation, and he's at the very tip of the triangle with his arms up in the air, and then he just drops his arms and everyone follows him into the woods. Are you hearing me? We talking about some freaky, crazy. Now, we're walking through the woods, people are picking flowers, some straight up hippie type crazy stuff going on. But I look at my mother and she's happy and she's healthy. So I'm thinking to myself, you know what? If this is what keeps you off drugs and keeps you out of the streets, so be it. Walk through the forest, picking leaves and picking flowers. Do whatever the hell makes your heart happy, mom. Now, when we get back, we have salad for lunch. And much of the stuff that we picked in the woods is what everybody put in the salads. And quite frankly, it was pretty freaking good. Dinner time rolls around. Mom and I go get our food and come back to mom's place. 
and we have a conversation. She opens up more about her life and the things she did and how she just wanted me to forgive her. And I'm looking in my mother's eyes and I realize that that's all she wants. She really wants me to forgive her. And I had no ill will towards my mother. So that night I forgave her and tears rolled down her face as she hugged me and thanked me for forgiving her. The next thing I remember is her going up into the loft and going to sleep and me laying down thinking to myself, you know, this whole thing really was just about her getting forgiveness. Part of me wanted to be upset with her because she wasn't there. But another part of me just said, you know what? My mom's human. I'm human. Everyone is human. I need to let all that go and just forgive her. And so I laid there and decided in my heart and in my mind that I really did forgive her. And that no matter what happened, that I would help my mother and I would do what I had to do to build a relationship with her. Now, I might not have the time exactly right, but I want to say it was about 1.10, 1, 1, 11 a.m. I had just kind of dozed off to sleep when I hear this breathing outside of the window, kind of like, you know, a horse sounds when they snort air through their nose. Then a few seconds later, I hear this sniffing, like something sucking air into his nose and then snorting air out of his nose again. So I get up and walk over to that window and prepare to look out. Now, wait, hold on for a second before I tell you what I saw. I don't think I've done true justice to the environment in which they were living. You know, you may be under the impression that they were in real houses, but they weren't real houses. These were tiny houses that everybody was living in. 30 feet by 8 feet with upstairs lofts. They were all on wheels. These were nowhere near being real houses. Now that you understand that I'm pretty much in a fancy box on wheels, I look out of the window and what I see is this head right there in front of the window but it's not pointed in my direction. It's looking off to my left, it's right. And in that moment, it just looks like this big old head of fur. My mind you, these are normal windows. You know, the kind that slide up and have the screen on the outside and they're not closed. That's how come I was able to hear all these sounds outside. So I'm standing there looking and then this thing walks away, never looking in my direction, going towards its right, my left, towards one of the other houses. It gets right there out of sight. And you know what I'm talking about. When you're looking through a window, there's a certain angle, no matter how far you go to one side, you can't see on that angle. It gets right out of my sight. And listen, I don't know if that was this thing's plan or if it just happened that way, but I'm there trying to look on that angle to see where it went and it disappears. So now I move my face back to the center of the window and the very first freaking thing I see are these ears start to rise up right in front of me and when i tell you these ears were as big as my hand that's how big these ears were and they're moving back and forth the next thing i freaking see is the crown of its head then i see the brow and then the eyes come up and i realize that i am face to face with this freaking thing by the time i saw the entire head snout included i damn near pissed on myself falling backwards away from that window coming to the realization that the only thing between me and whatever the hell that thing was was this flimsy house now pause right here let me ask you a question at some point in time everybody's done this you may have been at a hospital might have been at a high school basketball game you know how you put your money into the vending machine right and whatever you're buying doesn't fall all the way out of the vending machine. So you kind of put your hand on it and you rock the vending machine back and forth until it shakes loose. Well, that's what this son of a starts to do to this tiny house. He starts to rock this tiny house like it's a freaking vending machine. Now I'm... And so ends another descent into darkness. Thank you for joining us on this journey into terror. We hope these disturbing tales have given you a glimpse into the shadows where cryptids roam. If you have had your own bone-chilling dogman encounter, call 504-326-4268 to have your story told. Dark Waters is listening. For more terror, join the community at imdarkwaters.com. If you're already a member, log in to hear the full ad-free album, until next time, fear seekers, watch the woods carefully and keep one eye on the shadows. You never know what haunts the darkness or follows your scent. Stay safe out there, stay vigilant, and stay tuned.
we shall meet again in the realm of the paranormal, if you dare. Wait. I almost forgot the promo code that will be active over the next 24 hours. The code is JOB38. That is like the book of Job in the Bible, chapter 38.